uh, now. Okay, so um, if I can just give you a bit of a rundown of um, what we're going to try and cover this evening. So, as I said, I'm going to kick things off. I'm going to just run through um, the pathway document, which has recently been published by Wiltshire Cricket. I'm not going to spend too long doing this, but it's a really useful document that um, it'll be good to give you a bit of insight on and just to go over some areas in a little bit more detail. Then I'm going to hand over to Steve and, and, and he'll take you through his workshop. OK, so I'm just going to start off by uh, sharing the screen. Can everybody see that OK? Come three thumbs up. Well, good. OK, so as I said, Wiltshire recently launched the Talent Pathway Framework document, which was produced in conjunction with Gloucestershire um, and after quite a bit of consultation with local coaches and coaches in the pathway. This is available online at the moment. So Wiltshire Cricket has got two sections to the website. We have the Wiltshire Cricket section and we've got the Wiltshire County Cricket Club. So if you want to refer to this, it's in the Talent Pathway Framework tab at the top. Okay, and you can download it straight from the site. Okay, so here we have, if I just um, give you a bit of brief background to this document. So um, this is there for not just you as parents, but also coaches in the pathway, um, the boys in the pathway as well as a real kind of reference point to give you a bit of more information around what's to be expected, um, what sort of guidance our coaches work from in terms of uh, selection and decision making. And just if you are doing work with um, your child away from uh, their contact with Wiltshire Cricket you kind of know what they're working on and some of the sort of frameworks that we work from as well so the areas which it covers um, is um, pathway from club to first 11 an age group timeline uh, what the year will look like with Wiltshire Cricket skills frameworks personal attributes talent identification and player selection and some examples of some current county cricketers who started their journey in Wiltshire so as I said, if you've got any questions along the way, feel free just to pop them in the, uh, in the chat box and I'll do my best to answer them at the end. OK, so if I just kick things off by um, showing you the, the pathway from club to first 11. So it's pretty simple, really. Um, everything comes through the clubs in terms of uh, progression and, you know, selection for trials, nominations into the county programmes. From there, we have our Wiltshire and Gloucestershire Emerging Player Programme, which would be our sort of kind of flagship performance option for the boys in the pathway. And then from there, we have the senior sections of the second 11 and first 11 that compete in the NCCA competition. OK, so within each of these sections, I'm not going to run through this word by word because some of it's not relevant to you in terms of your son's age group. But it's on there as a reference point, just gives you some kind of headline key points for each of the age groups and what your son can expect and how it might differ from previous experiences or what's come ahead, really. And that runs all the way through from under 10s up to the first 11. Likewise, we have a timeline for what's to be expected at certain times a year. So this would give your son and yourself a really good understanding of um, when, when the sessions are likely to be and you know, what time of the year where it's busy and, and that sort of thing. So clearly we're coming into the June, July and August phase, which is probably the most important uh, time of the year, given this is when we have all of our fixtures. OK, so it's really important at the moment that you know, your son is sort of maximising their time with us in these games because clearly there's been a lot of work which has happened up until this point. So it's kind of capitalising on all the progression that they made throughout the winter. And a lot of that comes through availability and really being willing to, you know, play as much as possible, really. OK, and then within the document, we've got skills frameworks. So this is something which could be really useful for you as parents, um, particularly if you're working with your son away from our session. So 
if you're their one-to-one -one coach, like many parents are, like my parents were, um, this is a really good reference point. So how this works is we have different phases for batting, bowling and fielding. We have the early, early basic and enhanced stages. And it just gives you some guidance for some sort of focus areas at particular ages. So, for example, um, if we take batting, at an early phase, so under 10s and under 11s, we might focus on grip, back lift and balance before we look at a strategy and a skill for dealing with short pitch bowling, which really isn't relevant until they get to the sort of under 18 or EPP age. So it just gives you a bit of guidance. It also um, gives our coaches some structure to work from in terms of um, when to introduce uh, new types of challenges and focus areas for the winter. Now, if I can just refer back to the website, so within the skills framework, it's got its own section on the site. So if I just use batting, for example, and I'll use balance. So for each of these points that are underlined within the skills framework on the website, there is an additional video. So if you click on the ones with underlined, here's a video on balance. Essentially, this just gives you a little bit more information what we're talking about, some things you could work on away from home, away from the sessions at home. Starts off with one of the coaches talking about it in a little bit more detail. It then kind of goes into some analysis of international players and what are some sort of good common methods by the professionals. And then it kind of progresses on to some good ideas for drills and things to work on at home. So as I said, this is um, something which our coaches are utilising or will be utilising moving forward, but feel free to use it as much as you want. If you're working in your club as a coach, feel free to take it there as well and encourage the other coaches that you're working alongside to use it as well. And if you're working in a school, likewise. Okay, so just moving on to personal attributes which benefit most within the pathway. OK, so I'm not going to run through these, um, every, every single one of them. I'm just going to pull out a few key points. OK, and the most important one for me on here is number one, and that's that your child absolutely loves the game within practice or matches. And I firmly believe that's the most important one there, because not only will it be a more enjoyable process for them in terms of coming through the, the Wiltshire pathway, but it will be best for their development if they're enjoying the experience and they absolutely love the game, it's only going to fast track their progress. And the, I think the, the key is for us as coaches is to try and tap into what that actually means for each one of the boys. But for you as parents, it's just to try and remain, um, you know, this is something Steve will talk about later on, but just try and keep that real thing which kept your son engaged in the game in the first place and keep that as a constant throughout because that will not only make sure their development is fast tracked, but will keep them in the game for longer and they'll enjoy it more. I think if this can be combined with an ability to work hard and learn and retain information, not let the passion sort of get in the way of being having an ability to learn, I think you're onto a real winner here. The other one that I just wanted to touch on as well, if I can, is playing multiple sports. So we really encourage um, the boys in the pathway to play other sports. So don't feel that any stage in your son's journey in Wiltshire cricket should they have to make a decision around which sport to prioritise? Yes, if they progress on from Wiltshire Cricket into the Gloucestershire Academy and they're a fast bowler, they might have to consider whether they still want to play rugby at the weekend. But even then, there's still lots of good examples of athletes playing dual sports. So don't feel at any stage that your son's going to have to make a decision around that. OK, so just moving on to talent identification and player selection. So I think this is something which is quite relevant for parents. As you can see, there is lots of factors which are considered within talent identification and player selection, some which are a lot more relevant probably to your son situation than others. For example, um, you know, it's quite challenging to be able to gather whether a, an 11 year old's got a growth mindset from a three hour trial. But actually, if they've been in the pathway for three or four years, it is something we would consider when we're selecting for the EPP programme. Statistics there, that's an interesting one because that's generally the go-to for 
most people when it comes to selection and that is relevant you know statistics do matter but actually the evidence says that until they're under 17 there is no correlation with how well a player does at senior or professional level yes analyzing statistics across numerous years um, does provide a better indicator but just analyzing one-off games or years isn't a big indicator in terms of long-term development and talent identification. Other things which are really relevant here, like coachability um, and the skills framework. So how many of the points within the skills framework can your son tick off? I think that's something which is a really good kind of reference point for, for selection as well. Okay, and just lastly, it's just a few examples um, of current county professional cricketers playing either in first class system or internationally that have started their journey with Wiltshire cricket. So we've got James Vince, Liam Dawson, Tom Allsop and Craig Miles, all of which started within a Wiltshire club and a Wiltshire school and are now playing professionally in county cricket. So there is some really good examples there of what your son could achieve and I would encourage them to have that sort of aspiration and try and take their game to as high as they possibly can in terms of their potential and see these guys as real kind of hopes for them in terms of what they could achieve and for you as parents to sort of encourage those aspirations. Okay, so that's it from me in terms of the, the pathway document. If anybody's got any questions and they want to put it in the chat, feel free. Um, otherwise, I'm going to hand over to Steve. Great, many thanks, Tom. Um, and just to, to back that up, what an outstanding resource as, as well. I, I know the sort of work that goes into putting together that sort of document and cascading it down through through a county system. And uh, just just to say, I think that's an outstanding resource. So uh, please, everybody, you, use that. That'd be fantastic. Um, I'm just going to put a quick question uh, into the chat for everybody, um, just whilst we sort of transfer uh, present present into presentation mode. So, firstly, a, a quick question um, to everybody. Just pop in one word in the chat. What's your greatest challenge that you currently face as a cricketing parent? Just pop one word in there. Just while we we transfer over. Okay, can you just give me a thumbs up. Can can everybody see the screen there? Tom, can you? Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Okay, everybody. Well, just a, a very quick um, introduction. Um, so my, my name is Steve Williams. Um, I'm a level four uh, ECB cricket coach, worked for the ECB for over 15 years in talent development and uh, I was a regional under 15, under 17 coach for over 10 years for the Southwest and also was heavily involved in scouting for England under 17s, England under 19s. Um, I've done over 85 um, working with parent workshops over probably the last three or four years, some face to face, some online. But just to say, this is not a presentation to tell everybody how to parent. This is me just kind of showing some of the best bits, the, the real best bits of, of insight from psychology, leadership and talent development across the environments that I've worked in um, across the whole of the, the country across England and Wales I've been really lucky to pretty much be involved with all 39 counties and all 18 first class counties in some capacity at some point so I think the great insight I can kind of bring is quite a rounded profile and, and I understand a lot of the challenges that you as parents have I've got um, two teenagers um, myself here and and a baby so understand a lot of the challenges um, that you go through as a kind of a cricketing parent as well so without further ado I just want to very quickly um, we'll come back to some of the challenges later on but just say keep please keep your uh, keep your mutes on if you've got any questions pop them in the chat and and 
Tom will um, just keep an eye on that and we'll come back to those at the end. We'll have a break in, in the middle um, just for, for five minutes for kind of comfort break. I will forward through the slides to everybody at, at the end. Um, there's a lot of information that, that's covered because I'm, I'm really passionate about giving as much information as I possibly can. So um, just to say those slides will be sent through. The big thing we're all trying to do here is a little bit like a combination on a safe, whether you're a parent, a coach, or, or a player, we're all trying to unlock that potential to help them to become the best they can be. Um, content, as I say, will be sent through. And just to say, um, I think just as, as kind of backup to, to Tom, I've, I've known Tom for, for quite a long time and he's hugely experienced in the game um, and, and that document and, and the way he's kind of shaping the philosophy in Wiltshire cricket is really, really exciting. So just to say, I think from, from a perspective of somebody outside um, you're very fortunate to have Tom uh, and also Pete Sykes and the other coaches are, are really, really supportive of the, the talent environment. So this is what we're going to cover tonight. And the first thing uh, I'm going to do is basically give you a session within a session. So those of you that have really, really busy lives and really want to know, OK, Steve, I'm not going to sit here for an hour and a half. What's the real nuggets that you've got? Well, the first couple of slides I'm going to give you firstly my top 10 tips uh, for parents within cricket. And then I'm also going to share the top three um, mental uh, resources, if you like, or tools that I've come across in, in the 20 plus years I've been involved. Key things on, on this list here of 10 things, five, six and seven are probably the key ones. I see probably the most common challenges I see in young players are confidence, struggling to deal with setbacks, things like loss of form, injury, not being selected. And then finally, probably the biggest difference, I'd say, between an average county age group player and somebody that goes on, you know, like a James Vin to Craig Miles, Tom Allsop, they have some grit and resilience about them. So I'll give some ways in, in which we can maybe do that as well later on. So that's what we're going to cover. Firstly, just to acknowledge, um, parents do a fantastic job in, in cricket. I've seen that over the years. Tom does. And just to say cricket appreciates that. We appreciate the miles you put in as, as taxi drivers, the money that you spend on kit, coaching. Sometimes you're, you're a doctor, you're an administrator, you're a decision maker all the time, juggling different games, club, county, EPP. Sometimes you have to deal with injury, ups and downs, deselection, nutrition, getting them to choose the nutrition that you feel is going to help their performance rather than them going for their favourite fast food. And often you're, you're their coach, you're there at the side when things go well and things don't go so well so we we do understand the huge commitment that, that you give to the game and that's really appreciated so the session within a session 10 top tips here for you as parents so the first one is to really understand the nature of cricket now cricket's very different to football hockey or rugby there's a lot of thinking time particularly if it's a 50 over game or a two day three day four day game so encouraging your son or daughter to be able to switch on and off from a concentration point of view is really key to conserving energy. And just think from a, from a skills point of view, batters get one ball. So that can infer a lot of pressure. A lot of young players, as you know, put a lot of self-imposed pressure on themselves to kind of perform. And, and that's an important perspective, I think, that we can give as adults. But I think in the big picture, you know, we should be looking at the development, not to just the next game or this season, but look at it with a long term perspective. And the document that Tom's put together there and the principles of the skills framework are, are exactly alluding to this, that it shouldn't be about statistics and, and runs and wickets at 11, 12, 13. It's about developing. It's about developing their processes. So that's really important to understand. Second thing there is, is just in terms of questions, a really important difference is rather than taking a real interest in how many runs did you score today? How many wickets did you take? What were your bowling figures? Maybe ask them a process question. And, and by that, I mean, for example, how do you feel your footwork was with your batting today? Or what was your game plan? How effective was your game plan against spin? Or how good was your bowling rhythm today on a scale of one to 10 um, when you bowled that first spell? These sort of things are really, really important further down the pathway at kind of younger stages. And then looking at kind of maturational changes, um, teenagers, for, for example, their disposition, you get differences, they're often asleep uh, early in the morning, it takes them a while to kind of get up. And we see things like growth spurts and it's really important that we support and, and advise 
with things like workload and, and expectations around that. Car journeys. If you're tra traveling from, from Wiltshire to, to Truro for a Cornwall away game, you're going to be on the road for four, five, six hours. So that can be a really important opportunity to have a discussion and to help them have some some awareness of how they may be performed in the game and that type of thing. So car journeys can be quite key time. Motivation is another one. Um, we, we all know as a parent, sometimes it's really difficult to motivate them. They, they can be feeling tired, particularly if they've got other commitments. You've got clashes with things like school exams, other sports maybe that they play. So looking at what the, the cues are, what are the things that you're seeing that make you as a parent want them to say, look, maybe you need to take a bit of active rest here, or maybe it's a bit of time for, for recovery. That's really, really key in a busy season. I think this is a really important one as well. So a lot of players will suffer from maybe nerves or you know, str struggling with confidence, helping them to recognise whether what they're sensing is a mental thing is is it a thought is it a negative thought or is it a physical sensation is it a nervous thing i.e butterflies in in the stomach or just the kind of maybe sweat a little bit helping them to recognize that is really important we don't want to go in really heavy with with big strategies around anxiety uh, coping strategies and that type of thing but if we can help them to recognize particularly when they're younger that's really really good for for their cricket and, the, and their life in general dealing with setbacks this is a really really key one as well so helping them to recognize maybe what their derailer is um, is it something like lack of practice is it getting to a game late is it just their emotional response because cricket means so much to them and they they take things really personally if they don't succeed and we'll come back to this later on and this is probably one of the biggest uh, little secrets I think if you can hook into who their role model is so uh, and just ask them the question you know who's your favorite player I'll often ask that when I turn up to coach a player or a group of players you can find out a lot about what's important to them um, so if it's Ben Stokes well what is it about Ben Stokes what is it about Jimmy Anderson what is it about Joss Butler and and you can go much deeper than just into their cricket skills but also things like the concentration determination ability to work hard that type of thing deal with setbacks so that can be a really good tool routines as well uh, a lot of you will will know if you kind of watch other sports, whether rugby, um, hockey, football, or other disciplines, things like music or, or the arts, often it can be routines. Some set routines can help them perform to their best. So don't underestimate the importance of them maybe having some superstitions or some things that they do, maybe the night before the game, the day of a game that are really important to them because that can help them to perform consistently. And then finally, just to back up Tom's point, other sports to totally be encouraged because there's a lot of transferable skill. There's a lot of transferable uh, mental skill as, as well and, and resilience and that type of thing. And also it helps with recovery. So I've seen a lot of players over the years that maybe cricket's the only thing that they do. And the big concern with that is they can get to a certain age and burn out. And obviously, we, we don't want that. We want to maximise that fun, enjoyment, longevity in the game, irrespective of what level they ultimately get to. So definitely that's to be encouraged. So that's my top 10 very broad tips. I'll now come on to my, my top three mental tools to support young players. The first one, I think this, this is brilliant. So it's called a My Confidence Peak Chart. And I'll forward through the PDF uh, document to you just either print it off or, or take a photo of it and, and get get your son or daughter to, to fill it in and what you basically do it's just a picture with a number of mountains on it and on each of the peaks they should write down their top achievements in the game of cricket so it might be they got 100 not out for the county under 14s they got selected for the EPP program maybe they made the debut for the county first team Maybe they scored 50 off 25 balls to win a game. Whatever they are proud of and, and are objective achievements, this can be a really good anchor for periods when they're out of form or they don't feel confident. They can photograph it and, and have it in their phone. They can print a copy, copy off and have it on the bedroom wall or on the door. I've seen some players laminate this and, and put it in their kit bags. 
it is a really good tool to just build into their kind of routines, if you like. The second one, and, and this I think is a great tool for us as adults as well, is, is what I call a next ball focus or next event focus. So think of a time maybe where you've been road raged on, on the motorway or uh, a decision at work has, has gone against you or you've got stuck in traffic and been late for something. Being able to park that and not let it impact the rest of your game or your day is a, it's a really difficult skill, but a really, really important one. So I'm going to touch on this a little bit later on. So how we can maybe help to encourage our young players to, to park any mistakes. So if they've dropped a catch, rather than still thinking about that four, five, six overs later and it affects the rest of their performance, how can we get them to just recognise what's happened accept it, learn maybe from what's happened really quickly, and then just park it because it's wasted energy. And we all know that we'll have all been in situations where we find it difficult to park that. The adrenaline's pumping, you take, you take things personally, you're really frustrated at yourself. So that again is a really good tool. And then the third one, and I think this is one where we as parents can, can really, really be supportive. is what I call a one percenter analysis. So a one percenter is things like nutrition, uh, getting to a game early, maybe their practice schedule, maybe going out to the middle before before a game. It might be hydration. They're these little things that can mount up to make a really big difference. If anybody's heard of Dave Brailsford and the, the world of cycling, it's the accumulation of marginal gains is the official kind of talent development term. So those are my three top mental tools which, which i think make the biggest difference for for young players um what i'd like you to just very quickly do now in in the chat is is just from what you've seen on those two slides please just in the chat type or or on your phone uh, the key thing here is you pick one thing pick one element out of those that you're going to commit to doing or commit to supporting them with so i'll just go back to the top 10 tips there just please pop in the chat or, or on your phone, just the one thing that's maybe stood out for you that you think, ah, yeah, my son could really benefit from that. Or I think that might be a really good thing to help him or her with. I'll just have a quick look in, in the chat here. So Connell, thanks. Confidence peaks chart, next ball focus routine. Quite a lot of next ball focus going in the chat. Thanks everybody. Next ball focus. Good, that's brilliant. We'll touch on that in a bit more depth later on so thanks everybody for, for popping that in there okay so i just want to touch really briefly on some of the challenges that you might find as, as a pathway parent and to start with we're, we're all in this together as whether we're a coach parent player we all want them to optimize their potential on and off the, the field and what we're trying to do here is almost find the right key to unlock the door to unlocking that potential now you all have had challenges selection is a key one now my key tip around selection here at some point, they're going to not get selected for something. And the key thing with that is not to take that personally. Um, I've seen a, a lot of this over the years. I had to communicate a lot of these kind of decisions with regional cricket. And I think players and parents go one of two ways. They either listen to the deselects and go, well, and they put a wall up and they take it really, really personally. Or they go the other way and they actually take on board the feedback. And it can actually be one of the biggest accelerators of growth in a young player if they take a non-selection the right way and there's some feedback that supports them. I guarantee you there will be none out of all the top players in the world that have ever succeeded in pretty much any sport or at some point they will have not got selected for something. And I guarantee you that their response to that non-selection would have been a really key accelerator in their career. Form and, and outcome. So form, we're going to see that. That's the nature of cricket. It's ups and downs. 51 day, a duck the next. Really good bowling figures one day. So we as parents can really help to give that perspective. And I think being consistent around that. So not being too up with them when they do really well and not sinking too low with them when, when they're down. Um, I remember 
presenting one of these workshops in uh, a county in the Midlands a couple of years ago. And, and this one parent said that if my son does really well, I take him to Domino's and I buy him a massive pizza and treat him to a dessert as well. If he doesn't do very well, if he doesn't perform well, then we punish him and um, we he doesn't go to his, his swimming training in the week. And I kind of thought, wow, that's not helping. That's an extreme example. But one of the big things that you'll find in, in parental research and research around talent development is being consistent is really key. Growth and maturation, we've talked about managing workloads is big. And my big tip around this is, as Tom alluded to in his presentation at the start, having a calendar, having this mapped out, because there will inevitably be hot spots during the season. There might be a clash of EPP and, and club. There might be county and club. There might be an exam that clashes with, with club. And if there's a way of mapping this out early on, that's often where, with communication, uh, with coaches or, or with school, etc., these things get alleviated quite well. Success and failure. And, and I think there's a really important difference here that young players will see when they don't succeed as a failure. But what we need to encourage them to do is to see that as an opportunity to learn. So a good question for them is what have you learned from that? What's the learning in what you've done there today or how you've got out or how you've bowled? Motivational ups and downs, we'll see. We'll see other commitments, dual aspirations. Switching off is really, really important. Managing fixtures, so identifying where those hot spots can be. Managing time is one of the biggest pressures we've got. And then finally, it's just trying to build that self-reliance in them, getting them to make decisions for themselves. Tom and I and other coaches will be familiar with an expression of independent thinking cricketers. And, and that's what we're trying to create. Um, often. Coaches don't want to see players uh, where their parents are pulling their kit bags or their parents are doing their packed lunch or their parents are filling their water bottles up. Give them the responsibility to, to do that and start to lead themselves, their own preparation, their own routines that help them to play well. OK, on to developing a growth mindset. Now, a lot of you will have probably come across this concept in academic and school environments. Just very briefly, a fixed mindset is somebody that that really doesn't want challenges. A player that maybe wants to play in their comfort zone, they feel their ability is fixed, they're not really willing to take on board feedback, they maybe feel like their talent is capped and they're not going to get any better. They maybe even don't feel, they maybe feel threatened by other players that do particularly well in, in their team. Whereas a growth mindset is, is the opposite. And this is what we want to encourage is, is players that want to learn. They want the really tough situations. And th this can be quite a difficult thing. But as parents, if we can provide high support to high challenge, and this will be something that will be one of Tom's kind of key coaching principles within uh, the county age group environment and EPP is to provide challenge to players because it's challenge where the improvement comes. If players just play in their comfort zone, they score 100 every week, they're the dominant player, they're never going to get any better. They're never going to reach their peak. Yes, it's good for confidence, but it's a false confidence in a way. So really, really important that we as parents encourage mistakes, encourage failure. Failure is part of learning. So how can we help players to develop that growth mindset. This is a really key one to start with. If you say to your son or, or, or daughter, if you say, you're such a brilliant player, you're so talented, what, what do you think is going to happen? What's the response going to be? Well, we're going to see that they probably don't work as hard as they should do. They feel like they've made it already. It will breed complacency. So the key thing here, if we can, if we're praising anything, praise effort and hard work, because that will motivate them on to work harder, to want more and to just raise their ceiling. Secondly, from that, and, and if we look at performances where they've struggled, help them to reflect on what they've done well and not so well, and then feed that into their practice and again into targeted effort, a real focus around practice. Um, I've seen a lot of players over the years that they practice quite aimlessly. So looking at maybe how did they get out in the last game or maybe they got out sweeping um, against the left arm spinner. It was the wrong delivery. Getting them to then practice that in the next week is a good way of them accelerating their development and, and getting confidence from that as well. 
Fourth one here I think is really key. Encourage them to get into high challenge tasks, so into tough situations. Um, if you can, encourage them to want, want the battle. Want them to, if they're comfortable playing in the club third team, encourage them to, to want to aspire to get into the fourth team. Or if, if they're happy facing dad in the garden from, from 22 yards, we'll get dad to stand at 16 yards and throw it a bit harder and just upload the skill a little bit. So challenge is good with support around it. Also, I think this is really important. So we can sometimes be fearful of, discuss of not discussing errors and mistakes and only want to kind of keep the status quo and keep everyone happy. Encourage discussion around errors and mistakes and, and getting the kids to actually see these as opportunities to learn and develop. Even expand that into family discussions about mindset. Um, you might be watching the cricket at home one day and you can just bring that into conversation. Anything that kind of opens it up is really, really beneficial. And that will also help them to develop what I call a growth mindset internal voice rather than a fixed inset. So a fixed mindset internal voice would be, I can't play against this fast bowler, he's too quick, or I never score runs at Trowbridge. Whereas a growth mindset would be, I want this, I want to face this quick bowler. I feel good today. I feel in good form. I'm up for the challenge, that type of thing. So encouraging that growth mindset, internal voice for them is, is really, really key. Another key part of, uh, of this is mental toughness. Now, the four elements of mental toughness is briefly a commitment, challenge, confidence and control. And a key part of them helping to develop confidence, to come, come to deal with setbacks is, is to encourage these types of things. And this can often be um, be seen in, in young players and how they talk to themselves. And this can be a good thing for us as parents to understand, you know, what are they saying to themselves when they go out to bat? What are they saying to themselves on a way to a game? It may be they're not saying anything and, and their mind is totally clear. And that's great because what we ultimately want is what I call no traffic. But you also get some players that overthink it. They, they'll be thinking, oh, I'm not in good form. I don't feel very good today. Oh, we're going to be late to the game. I've not had enough throwdowns. The wicket looks green. So the reason I'm showing this slide here is on the right-hand side in the red, you've got negative self-talk, which is not going to help performance. And then the flip side comments are on the left in the green. And what I'd encourage you to do is, is when you get these slides, um, even maybe just sit sit down with with your son or daughter and and, and just say, look, I, I was on this this workshop the other evening. Um, this was really interesting. What do you think about this? What do you think when you're facing a quick bowler or you're you've just bowled a wide? What what goes through their mind? And this is just a good way of of engaging and understanding with where they're at and helping them to be self aware. And that's one of the best things that we can do. Another key element here as a tool is is them having a player diary. Um, this could just be three bullet points in, in their phone, in the notes after a game, you know, get in the car. Uh, it could be an A5 diary. It could be something online. The key thing here is that they actually do some reflection. It might just be one minute in the car after a game. You know, what did I do well today? One, two, three. What could I improve today? One, two, three. Don't underestimate how important a tool this is. Um, you, you see it a lot in first class county academy environments. Um, this is a key part of a, a player's development, if you like. So why aren't we doing it um, at county age group level and below? I think it's a really good tool. It helps them have a sense of pride as well. If they can look back at a season of, of reflections and where they've come from, that can be really empowering and good for confidence as, as well. Right, on to one percenters. Now, these are some of the key challenges that we see. Nutrition, too much screen time, them on their phone too often, perhaps, perhaps turning up late or being, being in a not particularly good mood when they walk out the door uh, to a game, perhaps not warming up well, not spending time catching and doing fielding practice, not being hydrated, and perhaps not talking through kind of challenges. Now, Without going through this in lots and lots of detail, um, and normally if I, if it was in a face-to-face -face, um, workshop here, we, we'd open this up in, in a bit more detail. But the key advice here, I think, is, is to help them to identify one of these and get them to use it as a target for the season. So John or, or Sarah, 
out of these, which one are you going to focus on to help your performance this summer? And often it comes to a negotiation around screen time or computers. I know it really, really well. You might have to negotiate and say, well, look, the night before a game, your, your phone and screen time goes at, at six o'clock because uh, obviously there are implications here with quality of sleep um, uh, as well. Uh, so I know it's a real challenge. I know it's a real, real challenge. So, but negotiating with them, I think, um, a certain number of days a week can be a, a good method. So really, really important to help them understand which are the one percenters they can make a difference on. Um, just before we have uh, a quick break, I just want to touch quickly on um, pathway opportunities. Now, this is a quick play a pathway, if you like, along the bottom on the x-axis, you've got the age group and then uh, kind of on the, the left hand side, the y-axis working up vertically, you've got kind of progression through the pathway. Now, everybody's ideal is that you would follow that that red line. You're somebody like a, a James Vince that goes you know, right the way through the system, county age group, EPP, regional cricket, academy, young lions, county cricket and progression. That is not generally the reality. Generally, there are, are setbacks and it's essentially a, a rocky road where there'll be ups and downs. You'll be, there'll be deselection. There'll be selection back in. That's the nature of it. So my key message here from my years of experience of this and, and around other sports, there is no entitlement to selection. That's a really good message to get across because often it's taken personally. Any deselection is really difficult because it means so much to them that they don't take it personally. But if we can encourage them to see the opportunity of which there are loads, players will go into um, national counties cricket, universities cricket, and come into the pathway later. Some players will peak at 15 and they won't get any better. Others won't reach their peak until 24, 25, 26. There are players who, who get into full county cricket at, at that kind of age. So recognizing this if if your son or daughter gets not selected at some point help them to see the opportunity in it and help them to to get back to really enjoying what they're doing take the feedback on board and work hard because that is a good life skill you know if, even if they don't make it as a professional cricketer they're going to go for job interviews etc uh at 17 18 19 and beyond they might not get the first one so they have to have some resilience so actually going in and out of a pathway builds some resilience in young players. So it's actually to be welcomed. I know that sounds difficult. This rocky road is, is a really key concept to understand. And I think helping, helping young players to, to recognize there'll be good days, uh, bad days. They've got to battle through some of the tougher days. And the part of becoming good or competent or a master of anything is that sometimes you have to go through some difficult days. The sun doesn't shine every day so this is a really good diagrammatic representation i think and just finally before we take a break uh, and some quick quick questions i think this is a good diagram to just keep in mind so you've always got three circles there and an overlap in in the middle so every young player will bring something genetic to the table they might be naturally a quick bowler with fast twitch fibers they're in a, in a good environment here in in wiltshire and under tom and other coaches jurisdiction and support they'll be in good environments elsewhere at club and county but ask the question from a psychology point of view how how mentally tough are they how resilient are they how good is their confidence and what we often see with young players is they'll be good in two of these circles but one of them lets them down on the flip side there are players that have been in great environments really strong mentally but not got the talent but maybe they've worked so hard that they get through to a really good level because of work, great and environment. So just keep these three circles kind of in, in mind as well. I think they're really important principle of, of developing talent. OK, just before we take a quick five minute break, um, has anybody got a question? Does anybody want to just raise a, a virtual hand or Tom, have you got any comments or, uh, or questions you'd like to ask before we just take a quick break? Very questions from me, Steve. Just picking up on one of the questions that appeared in the chat. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, good. Yeah, so one of the questions which appeared was, what is our relationship with Gloucestershire? Uh, so Wiltshire's in a formal sort of relationship with Gloucestershire. We're partnered with them. It covers a variety of areas from uh, the pathway through to sort of 
corporate areas and into coach education. Um, the areas which are particularly relevant um, from your perspective as um, parents of boys in the pathway is that at the moment they um, deliver weekly on our EPP programme and they will fill some of the specialist skills which uh, we don't necessarily have within our coaching teams that might be strength and conditioning. Um, Steve also delivers on our EPP through online um, workshops with, with the boys as well, but Gloucestershire deliver that on a weekly basis. Um, we have one of our boys which has left our EPP to join the, we two actually, to join the Gloucestershire Academy. So that's the kind of next step on from the Wiltshire EPP really, it's to progress on through to the Gloucestershire Academy. And that's the most sort of um, direct connection, I suppose, with, with the pathway. Hopefully that answers your question. And just to back that up as, as well, Tom, I, I've worked with, obviously worked with Gloucestershire for, for quite a long time and Wiltshire as well. And the, the two line up there, for example, the document, the talent um, and skills framework that, that Tom's put together, they line up really well as well. So um, I think it's important just to mention that, that there's some good alignment between the, between the two. Excellent. And any, any other questions, any, anybody? Okay, we'll take so we'll take a five minute break. Okay, so if we can come back. Please, at... please. Um, sorry, I, I just put my question in the chat. So, um, okay, so minutes? Tom, there's another one in there. Can there be some sessions arranged with first, I guess that's first team Wiltshire team players or prior players that might help boys inspire and to know their stories personally? Yeah, sure, it's a good idea. So, just to give you a bit of background information, the Wiltshire first 11 up until last year was a completely separate um, club or organisation than the the, um, the pathway. So it seems, it seems strange, but they weren't connected really. And it's been part of quite a big bit of work of Pete Sykes to pull the two together. So we are starting to do more and more stuff together now. So our EPP trained alongside our first 11. I actually sent an email out to the parents in the EPP earlier on, whereby one of the first 11 players is now acting as a mentor for those on the EPP who has formerly been a professional cricketer and gone through the sort of um, pathway himself um, and it's definitely something we can do more on. Um, we've got a game this Sunday actually which is at Marlborough and alongside that there's an under 13s game going on and a women's game so we're starting to do more and more but yeah certainly it's something we, we, we could um, we could utilise so the boys in the pathway benefit. Thank you. Quite Thanks, Tom. Can we come back on the same Zoom code or just keep it live and open this chat? I would I would keep it open. Yeah, just keep it open. Maybe just put it on mute and go down on off, off your videos. If, if we take five five minute break, come back at um at about 5:57, that'd be great, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Right, we'll uh, we'll move on to. I think this is one of probably the most crucial things that we can help our young players from from a tools perspective is to help them build confidence and uh, the self concept that they'll have around cricket. There's obviously a lot of challenges, isn't there, in in the world at the moment with social media, the the pressure at school, peer pressure, etc. Um, some of the challenges that, that our young people kind of face in, in society nowadays. So I think this is even more important. And for, for a lot of your sons and daughters, cricket will be a part of their identity. Other sports, other activities they do will be a big part of their identity as, as they grow up. So I think this is even, even more crucial. So there are really two tools that I want to just share here. The first one is the My Confidence Peaks chart, which I've talked a little bit about before. And the second one is, is encourage them, encouraging them around positive self-talk. So maybe recognising the difference between negative and, and positive and, and almost getting to a space where they maybe have a, a couple of expressions or maybe one word in cricket that's almost a trigger word for them. So it might be if they're a, a bowler at the top of their mark, maybe a word like drive or energy or complete, or maybe if they're a, a spin bowler, because it's more about fine motor control of, of their fingers, maybe it's just relax or chill or, or as a batter, um, you, you know, batter might say rhythm or flow or something that just helps to 
make them not think about anything else and also a, a trigger word it might be something like watch the ball I expressions like that can be really helpful but firstly the my confidence peak chart so what i'd encourage you to to do with this is is either print it off or, or take a photo of it, whatever. Get them to just identify their top achievements at the top of each peak, okay? And then what it will help them to do is, is anchor success, be reminders of good performances as you might be on the way to a game, uh, you might be on a long car journey, you might be able to, sh they might be able to look at that regularly. It might be a poster on their wall. It could also include some other things that give them confidence. It might be academic achievements, um, it might be other sports that they play and any other thing they might have captain teams or anything that they're proud of that's undisputable. It's a fact so that you, you can actually say to them when things are down, you go, well, actually, just go back to your My Confidence Peak chart. Look at, look at what you've achieved. And this should be built on year after year. Um, I'm going to show an example now of uh, a pro player. So this was John Simpson, who's... Um, Middlesex batter keeper played for England last year, so um, he was he was on a call, did one of these for us, and his were those elements in red you can see there, um, and then actually in the 2021 season, so last season, he actually then added two elements to it. There was a 71 he scored off 28 balls in the hundred, and his England ODI debut. So. The, these are the sort of things that I think we can also think of as an adult that can, can even be useful in, in our lives or things that we're trying to achieve. It's a really, really good tool that first came from, uh, I first saw it from a sports psychologist called Steve Bull, who worked with the um, England senior team for, for 10 years, um, now works quite heavily in big blue chip um, businesses, uh, FTSE 100, et cetera, businesses. It's a really, really effective tool. The second one is, is, as I said, just because cricket's got a lot of thinking time, you know, you think as, as a batter between balls, between overs, when you're at the non-striker's end, helping them to just have an expression, um, you know, something like just do it, or I've trained hard, I feel good today. These are really good to help, one, give them confidence, but two, stop any doubts or negative thoughts coming in. And just a tool I shared with, with Tom, with, with some of the EPP players, why not have a word that they write on their thigh pad that's the trigger word? It might be warrior. If that means something to them, if that means that they work hard, want the challenge, are resistant in the game, it might be more a process type thing like watch the ball or as a bowler, rhythm or drive um, for, for a keeper. It might be loose arms or easy hands or move well. Helping them find something like this, again, is a really good little tool. So I think those are two of my best tools that I've seen for confidence. Quite simple, very relatable for age sort of 11 up to whatever age. Second one uh, here, which I think is a really key theme, is dealing with setbacks. Now, I'm just going to share eight common responses to mistakes here or, or failure. The first one is the kind of fixed mindset response. You know, I never bowl well here. Um, I'm an opening batter. I never bat well at six. I hate bowling second change. These are fixed mindset things when what we should encourage them to do is see these as opportunities. Certainly a lot of the, um, the talent pathway work that I've been party to over the last sort of 15 years, batters should, should try to look at every place in the order as an opportunity for them to develop skills. Um, you know, if they move up from second 11 to first 11 in a club environment, they're not going to go straight into opening the bat. And so they've maybe got to learn what it takes to bat at seven, eight. So, again, this is quite key as a parent where with our experience and observations, we can share some perspective on this. Blame we see a lot of. And my counter to that is I think it's important for young players to be accountable to, to take responsibility if they weren't concentrating and, and dropped a catch or they played uh, a shot that was not on, they maybe tried to play a ball on the up on a, a seeming pitch when the team was 40 for six, getting them to be accountable and take responsibility is really, really important. And a good life skill as well. A lot of this stuff that I'm talking about is really translatable to other areas of their life as well. Catastrophizing is a big one. Oh, 
I got another duck today, Dad. I'm just a useless batter. I just can't bat. We, we often see that. So again, the My Confidence Peaks chart can help with that if you've got some objective uh, performances or achievements that you can kind of go back to. Dwelling is a big one as, as well that we see. And this is one where maybe you're on a car journey. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have been on a car journey where you've been perhaps on a, on a long journey back from somewhere, you're in the car, you're stuck in traffic, you can tell looking in the mirror that their disposition's not great, they've not had a great game. Sometimes what's called a, a pattern interrupt or a complete change away from cricket can be the best thing. You know, trying to diffuse that by music, singing, laughter, humour, even relating to siblings and what they're doing or taking the mindset really away from cricket and, and and that's I think a really important barometer that we have to have as parents is is it a time to help them to reflect and learn or is the time not yet and do we just need to talk about something else and let them come to us and that's quite a key distinction um you know it's interesting I'm trying to hear to talk about parental experts but I've uh, there are some parental experts in a number of different sports that talk about letting the player come to us. So rather than us trying to instigate a perspective conversation, actually trying to time it, let them come to us first. And that can, can be quite a, uh, a key thing for us, I think, to just try out as a parent. Negative self-talk is really big. So if, if we can replace that negative one with a positive statement, even a word, uh, at the younger ages can be really, really powerful. Spiraling emotions, we, we've all kind of have seen this. Um, and then the final one, unprofessional behaviour. So things like throwing bats, throwing gloves. There, you, you, you're in your rights to actually have quite a hard line resp response that actually you need to respect the game, you respect the opposition, you're representing your county, you're respecting, you're representing your club. Most importantly, you're representing yourself and I've seen some young players who at a young age um, have maybe done certain things like this in games and, and coaches and selectors and uh, observers will kind of remember that. So uh, one of the workshops I talk about with, with players is your brand as a cricketer. So I think it's important to help them grow their brand as a cricketer, if that makes sense. And then, you know, if you look at these, the big question is, are these behaviours or these responses that I've gone through here, are they helping their cricket? And if they're not, then, then they're not beneficial. So the important thing, I think, is to help them recognise what they do, raise awareness um, and, and then look at, a, look at a, different, a different way. So this is going on to the, the next ball strategy or this can be a next game strategy as well so what we're ultimately trying to do here uh, and it moves from top left down to bottom right so we go from recognize down through accept learn park it and next ball you're probably all saying saying to me steve well this is all very well but that's not going to be easy for a, a 13 year old to do very quickly is it? it it does take time but actually what a life skill what a life skill if you can encourage them to just recognize what's happened recognize perhaps what what they're feeling get them to just accept it and then very quickly what's the learning from it okay i played at a loose delivery i should have left it okay there's no point in me dwelling on that i've learned from it right what i need to do is just park it and put all my energy and be mindful into the next the next delivery because and the big message is there's no point dwelling what is the point on dwelling on something that's gone the only benefit we can have is to learn from it. So your objective here is to get to the, the two last stages as quickly as possible to park it and, and get focused into the next ball, because I think this is one of the biggest derailers of, of young players and young performers, particularly when they're in a pressure situation in a game. You, you see batters that are still thinking about when they got dropped a couple of overs previously or a bowler has got taken over, has got taken off in his first spell for bowling four overs for for fifty, and you can see his head's down and he's having a meltdown at fine leg. His actual a constructive response is actually put your energy and that frustration that you're feeling into making a difference in the field, and then coming back on your second spell to make an impact. 
So this this is, I think, a, a really good process to start to follow. Um, you know, it, it takes time. You know, it's not an easy thing for us as adults to do. I, I get that. But it is a great tool. And I'll tell you what, if you want to make a difference in, in their performance and their consistency, this is a good one, a really, really good one, particularly bearing in mind the nature of cricket. If you look at hockey, rugby, football, you don't have time to think. There's not the same thinking time that you get between overs, between balls that you have in cricket. So the nature of cricket lends itself to this dwelling, this too much thinking. So getting them to learn when to switch on and off and, and park what's gone, I think is a really important perspective we can add as parents. Okay, building grit and resilience. Well, obviously trying to encourage them to, to want tough situations and go into challenges a really key part of this. There's also something on a day-to-day -day basis here, I think, that we can just drip feed in a little bit. So maybe getting up an, an hour early before before going to school and, and doing some, some prehab, some stretching for half an hour or a gentle jog or some of the work that other work that Tom might kind of um, allocate the players. Um, it might be going for a, a run or a cycle in, in the rain when the conditions aren't ideal. It might be getting schoolwork or preparation for exams out of, out of the way first to earn the right to your cricket training or your cricket matches. That's something that was a, a principle with the England under 19s. Whenever they went away on tours, it was about you had to get your schoolwork done first. Otherwise, you didn't train. And, and what this does, it might seem harsh, but it, it builds resilience. And you can't expect to, to have resilient players on the pitch if, if they've never had any experience of having to do it off the pitch. So drip feeding, um, I'm quite a big fan when I when I do these calls or work with players of setting players what I call a grit challenge. Um, an example would be choose one of these three things. So you either get up half an hour early for five days in a row and, and say do some mobility work or do some schoolwork. The second option might be that you go and prepare um, a really nutritious meal. So it might be uh, rice, steamed vegetables and plain chicken, no sauce. It's a bland meal, but it's nutritious. They probably don't want to eat it, but actually go and eat it. That's resilience. Or the third one might be we go for a cycle or a jog in the rain or when, when it's windy outside, when the conditions aren't ideal. And, and this is just helping them to understand and, and learn and almost enjoy getting into the battle. If you look at somebody like Ben Stokes, he's somebody that from a young age went into these sort of resilient situations. And is it any wonder if somebody like that ultimately over a number of years develops that resilience and fight and bounce back ability and, and ability to, to fight in pressure situations because he's kind of gone through some adversity, he's put himself purposely through some adversity over the years. And, and that's really, really important. Another example is coming back from bounce, you know, being hit by a bouncer, maybe having three or four fielders around a bat or batting on difficult pitches. Um, I remember going to a an indoor uh, pro session at a county, I won't mention which first class county it was, but literally the coach had literally tipped sand and put water, empty water bottles literally on, on the pitch. So the batters had to play um, when there's literally sand. So the bounce was uneven. It would occasionally hit a bottle. But what the principle was, it was about overtraining. It was about doing something more difficult so that when you actually go back to the normal task, it seems that much easier. And that's a really key principle of, of talent development it's can you overtrain it can you push it harder can you upload and challenge the skill um, you've then got things like the, the the physical training uh this is a really important part of the game today uh of being physically strong physically fit it's also a key part of staying injury free um so those are just some kind of examples and grit's really made of two things perseverance so the kind of degree of strength to to persevere on something and the other thing is kind of the passion so working to towards a kind of a definite or a longer term goal and, and not sort of abandoning tasks or giving up on something is really kind of kicking through
These are some quick tips for kind of developing grit and resilience. Well, one is to just stop them being lazy, help them to break that path of resistance. The second one, these can be good tools. So finding out who their role model is, um, maybe they have a poster of that role model up on, on the wall. It can be music, it can be a, a Rocky video, Ashes video, whatever inspires them and gets them going, help them to find that. Uh, help them to get clarity on their goals. So where do they want to get to? Uh, what are their ambitions in, in cricket? And, and then day by day, what can you do to help that? Um, a key thing you, you will see in the course of the season, you'll see motivational ups and downs. Well, how can they prime enthusiasm on a day-to-day -day basis? What could you do to keep that uh, motivation really alive? Scheduling things. So make sure things are calendarized. You can identify those hot spots. You maybe block time for practice, which I'm, I'm sure you do anyway. And then enlist that broader team that's out there, coaches, teammates, friends you know th there is a lot of support out there and, and everybody wants the best for for those young players and then help them set their environment so um what is it that helps get them motivated what what have they got in their room that are symbols of, of needing to kind of uh perform and, and work hard uh, and there's some examples there and then i think also support them really quickly uh, and help them identify what the derailer is so if they do go off the rails or they have a bit of a meltdown just help them recognize quite quickly what's happening um, and, and what maybe is a, a more effective response and i love this quote from michael clark the former uh, aussie batter and captain if you don't practice grit you don't deserve success and if, if you're looking to really master something that, that's really really key is to, to help them to push through the tough stuff when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I just want to slow, show this slide here. This, this I came up with um, during the lockdown, and we, we kind of called it a wellness top 10. And, but it's a really important part of helping young players develop resilience. And it's around healthy habits. So you might help them to pick one or a couple of these that they maybe do on, on, a, on a daily basis. So it might be positive self-talk. It might be they set themselves a list for the day. And at the end of the day, they physically tick them, tick them off and give themselves a pat on the back for what they achieved. It might be around hydration, little and often. It might be this thing of adding to the family pot to, to keep them humble. Um, so what are they putting into the family pot? You will be taking them all over the country probably to play cricket. Uh, what are they giving back? And this is really important for, for young players to help keep them grounded. So it might be um, spending some time out to go and, and watch a, a sibling or su support a brother or sister in what they do. It might be washing mum or, mum or dad's car. Um, anything to kind of support, it might be doing the washing up. Anything to kind of keep them humble in some way and, and centred is is really good. I think that's a good tool. Um, things like moderating screen time. So I think this is a really good kind of list. Maybe get them to you know, have a look at these and, and just identify one, one that they know they can put into practice. So onto this principle of, of process, not outcome. Now, by outcome, I mean statistics, averages, runs, wickets, focusing on that. Process is more about um, the skills within the game. So things that they do with their batting. So it might be their batting footwork. It might be their backlift, their game plan against spin, uh, their routine, their pre-ball routine for a bowler. It might be their run-up and, and how that feels. It might be the, the feel of the ball coming out of the fingers. It might be how well they feel their follow-through. That's process. Now, there's a lot of value in asking the more process-based base questions rather than outcome. Um, I did, I have seen some research that quite heavily says that if, if we focus really heavily on outcome type questions, then, then young players can think, oh, the person that's asking only really cares if I score runs or take wickets. There is research out there that kind of depicts that. So, um, you know, I did a lot of research into this over, over quite a period of time. Now, the car journey can be a good time to do this. And a really good rule to, to bear in mind is on the way to a game or training, help them to remember good performances and help them to get motivated. After a game, help them to reflect. So that's where your process type of questions come in to, to help them to learn because... 
some of the players that that don't or some of the players that don't kick on as quickly are those that just they might just go to training or they play games but they do nothing in between those that really kick on and accelerate in in any endeavor are those that do things between training they reflect on what they've done they look forward to the next part so they're almost building a chain in between training so you can really assist that as a parent with that car journey thing but the big principle is probably time in that conversation maybe letting them come to you if it's been a difficult game um, it'll be a lot easier if it's been a kind of a successful one so i think seeing that difference so just to repeat on the way to a game help them to be motivated to look forward to it to remember past good performance because that gives confidence positive expectation after a game really good opportunity to reinforce the good but also you have a great opportunity a really golden period of time to help them to learn by reflecting on what they've done in that game so here are some examples. I won't dwell on these, but obviously I'll send this through, but um, I've broken them down here into some examples for batting, bowling and fielding stroke wicket keeping. So an example with, with batting that is process orientated. How was your game plan today against spin? If you were just to ask that as an open question, they could probably talk for ages. They might sort of say, well, the pitch was turning a lot, dad or mum. You had a left arm spinner at one end, off spinner at the other end. I felt like I used my feet really well off the front foot, but I didn't really get back into the crease and, and rotate ones to the shorter ones. So maybe that's something to improve. And and you just open, you just open, open it up. So the, these are some good questions that you can kind of potentially use. OK, so just really quickly, just a check in with everybody, um, just before we go on to the very last bit, which which is quite short, just in the chat, please type one word from what we've gone through so far that will describe how you will approach being a cricket parent going forward. So just one word that maybe encapsulates what's coming out for you and just just post it in the chat, please. So we've got focused support. Let him come to me, grit, carefully, motivate, supportive, patient, motivate, encouraging, listening, process. Excellent. Great words. And the, the important thing here, I think, as, as we move towards the kind of the end of the session and takeaway is, is what are the real what are the real couple of things that you're going to take away that can make a difference for your your son or daughter? Because everyone is different. What what resonates for one parent won't for another, and what what will work for one child won't for another. Uh, again, some great words in there: adapt, balance. Mark, that's that's a good one. That's one of my three kind of top words that I'll allude to at the end. One percent, excellent, great stuff, everybody. Th thanks for for that. That's super. Just very quickly, this is the last thing, and this is a whole different workshop really it's a whole nother workshop but something i'm really passionate about is how we help young players perform under pressure and this is not just about cricket this is around the classroom uh kind of growing up all those sort of things as well but obviously this is in the context of cricket so two areas in which you can help firstly the blue arrow you can support what they do before the match so that's things like the routines getting school work out the way maybe supporting with time for, for practice, ensuring they do the warm up, maybe ensuring they prepare or they get the right nutrition. And then the second element is, is the, red, the red arrow. And this is really where it's different. It's about giving them space and the responsibility to, to do it in the match situation. So this is where you, you let them, once they get over that white line, let them do their thing. You, you want them to make decisions for themselves, be independent thinking cricketers and, and just go into those challenges. And then again, I'm quite a fan of these top 10. I think it was probably because I used to listen to the, uh, the charts on the radio when I was a, a little kid, the top 40 and always remember the top 10. So uh, another top 10 here. But as I say, it's a, it's a whole different workshop, this. But some key elements here are we've, we've talked about. So being mentally tough, living those four C's. Um, being proactive to be consistent, understanding there's no I in team. Cricket is quite an unusual game because it's a team game played by 11 individuals. And that's something that uh, I think it's important for young players to remember. Doing those one persisters, uh, one percenters consistently well. Uh, what we often see with young players is they might 
uh, sip water and have good hydration for the part of the day, but then forget about it. Or they might eat uh, you know, a healthy tea for one game, uh, but then it goes out the window the next couple of weeks. Or they practice a sweep shot for two weeks, but then they forget about it. That's the difference between being an average player and really kicking on in, in the system is, is just doing these things consistently well over time. Uh, number seven there, learning from past performances, resilience, confidence. And that bottom one there, and it links into Tom's one, I think, about really enjoying what they're doing but and having fun and loving the game, but also being humble about it. And I love that, that little tool of what are they putting back back into the family part. Uh, and that was an expression I heard from um, a coach that was working with, with the England under 19 players, where they actually were trying to get them to be much more grounded and appreciative of, of where they were at. And actually asked that question, said to the players as a group, what are you putting into the family pot when you get back? And it's quite a good, it's quite a good question. So very briefly, last bit, and this, this is if, more thinking about transition from indoor to, to outdoor. Um, there's a, a top 10 things not to do here, but I'll just touch on top 10 tips for outdoor transition. I mean, they'll all be outdoors now, but they're quite important, these. So one, make sure they've got process goals going into games. So it's not just about, oh, mum, dad, I want to score 1,500 runs and take 70 wickets this season. Actually, you're, you're on a developing part of the pathway what are your process goals? So going to this game, um, I want my footwork to be quick and efficient or I want to feel rhythmical in my run-up. Those sort of goals are things that irrespective of the performance, you can have, or the outcome, you can have a good discussion afterwards, which doesn't get them caught up in, oh, I've got to score runs or I've got to take wickets. It's, it's quite an important distinction that. Use that My Confidence Peaks chart. I think that's really key. Um, this is a good expression. It came from Matt Pryor, the former Sussex and England batter keeper. Get nervous early. And what he meant by that is if you've got a game on a Saturday, don't wait to practice on the Friday night or to think about it or to do your kit bag on the Saturday morning. Plan it. Get them, a, get them ahead. This, again, is quite a big differentiator between average players and those that really kick on in, in the system. Um, this is a little bit more getting into the kind of the skills. So batters will, will often play shots that are, are not on outdoors. They kind of think they're on that indoor surface where they can play on the up and on the flip side, bowlers will perhaps bowl a little bit short. So they need to pitch up a, a little bit more and they're getting used to run-ups and that type of thing. But these are good things just to be aware of. Again, you can't expect to take really good catches in, in matches or throw really well if you don't practice it. And, and often I know from working with a lot of counties, they, it, it's difficult to get coaching time in for fielding and, and catching volume, but there's nothing to stop you doing it at home or with friends or after school. It, it can be a really good use of time for them. You, you only need, I mean, you can even do catching practice yourself. I can remember... Um, doing it or encouraging players to just take a bat and a ball, literally just like take the ball, hit catches up, throw the bat, hit the ball up in the air as far as you can, drop the bat and just go and chase it. You can do that in any space. So that's quite a key one. And if they do stand out as a fielder and they really love it, that can give them confidence for their other skills as well, the batting and bowling. And it's a big part of the game. If, if you want to help selection further up the line when they get older, then be a standout fielder, be what I call three-dimensional. If you're a batter that doesn't bowl, then start to learn to, to bowl as well and, and field really well. Become three-dimensional. It's a big part of the game. Look at the 100, T20, et cetera. Literally, you, you, if, you, if you've got a 12-year-old, 13-year-old at this stage and, and they have obviously a predominant skill or a primary skill, encourage that second skill. It might not be that they work on it as hard in their county environment because that's often not realistic, but there's nothing to stop them doing it in their club or their school environment. So when they get to 15, 16, 17, actually, you've got a, a three-dimensional cricketer that's very difficult to, to not select. So it does help in selection as well. Consistent routines, you can really help that as, as parents. I know there can often be, be challenges with traveling long distances and you know we've got busy lives our, ourselves. And but but finding out what your young person values in their routine and their prep for a game, you know, do they like getting their 
10 minutes before everybody else and feeling relaxed do they like having a certain meal the morning of the game etc um so, so keep finding that out that will develop as, as they get older this is a really good tip i think um keep it simple so i know i've talked a lot tonight about psychology and, and leadership and um you know a lot of the kind of mental stuff as soon as they step over that white line you want you want it to be simple no traffic no thought just simple trigger a simple trigger word or something that's what we're trying to get to really is, is keeping it simple um because a lot of a lot of young players cricket means so much to them that they think about it a lot and they'll put a lot of pressure on themselves and often what they they end up doing is this paralysis by analysis and and it almost stops them from being free to express themselves so helping them to see that the failure is good or mistakes are part of becoming a better player helps to alleviate that um as does having some the my confidence peaks chart as, a, as an anchor and, and just some simple phrase simple phrases that or words that really um trigger confidence for them basic swats of strengths weaknesses opportunity threats reflection on each game what did you do well what could you do differently next time um this is a great one i think staying cricket sharp uh, as parents we often see don't we maybe in july or august when they're playing lots of games um you, you can start to see signs of burnout so look for that um and communication is the big thing the where i've worked with counties over the years often there will be hot spots there are always clashes the key thing is can you identify them early um and speak to the relevant parties and then there's there's never a problem it diffuses it really really quickly um, and identify those hot spots if if you can i know it can be difficult in cricket because sometimes fixtures can be changed last minute or venues etc but as best you can have a skeleton of when everything is um it will help help you as well um so i think that's quite a key one and then the, the bottom one finally there um really help them to enjoy and relish the pressure moments because this is a good life skill as well not only in cricket but in in other spheres of of life they'll go into pressure situations so cricket can actually be a really good tool that prepares them for it because you can feel pressure a lot in cricket it's a sport that lends itself to that there's quite intense moments and you've got to bounce back from difficulties and setbacks the inherent nature of the game is around that so that can give them really good coping skills for other elements of their life so in summary um at the top we we covered that top tip session within a session so my kind of top 10 tips for for cricket parents uh, and then those three mental skills we looked a little bit at some of the challenges you face growth mindset opportunities around the pathway and then those real engine room nuggets there five six and seven how do we help players to build confidence how do we help them deal with setbacks how do we help them develop grit and resilience and then number eight um, a little bit around the importance of how we can ask process-based questions rather than than outcome and that actually the process is really important for young players that they develop their skills they're on a journey up the pathway it's not all about the the outcome the runs wickets yes there's a time where that becomes important but they're talented players within a system that develop at very different rates so enjoying the process and getting immersed in the process can stop them from feeling self-imposed pressure can stop them feeling the reliance on on results can free them up to express themselves much more um then number nine just touched very briefly on performing un under pressure uh, and then finally just a little bit about what can be good for kind of outdoor transition so this is the really really important bit i'm sure a lot of you on the call go to go to or have been to conferences workshops of, of varying descriptions in, in your work life education etc how many of them do we go to and we take on board the information but then we, we get home or we kind of rush back somewhere and we don't do anything about it well, what I want you to do, I want you to commit to this because this is because this is all for us trying to optimize the talent of of our sons or daughters. So what I want you to do now is, is just write down, grab your phone or a piece of paper. And I just want you to write down three specific things, three specific actions that have resonated with you from tonight that you're going to commit to do to help your son or daughter to kind of maximize their talent. 
Uh, and then what you might do post this session, you might want to share the slides with them. You might want to just sort of say, hey, I was on this, this workshop the other night with Wiltshire Cricket. Um, these three things kind of came up for me. I'm just really interested to see what you think about them. Or, you know, what do you do in that way in your game? So if you can just spend a moment now, just for a minute, and then what I'd like you to do, if, if any of you are happy enough just to, to share them, either, either just pop the, the three in the chat, or if, if anybody's really wants to just mention them on the call, or anybody's got some questions that relate to it. So this is a good time as well, whilst people are, are obviously writing or typing those down. If anybody's got any questions, um, really happy to, to take them on anything related to the content or, or anything additional that's that's come out for you. Um, I've got a quick question. So when when do you actually find out? Because obviously at the moment we're we've we've done sort of winter uh, training and now coming into the summer, so we don't know whether or not our child is going to get into the actual uh, EPP team as such. So do you know when that actually happens? It's probably one for you, Tom, isn't it, locally? Sure, yeah. So the, the next intake for EPP uh, would be actually at the end of the summer. So the EPP don't play matches. They, they just um, uh, they have training and additional support. Yeah. So that will uh, commence again um, in November. So the selection process for that will be through September. And then there'll be a review of who is on the EPP for the, the post Christmas sessions. And then that will run through to the summer. So it, how that program looks differs um, at certain times of year. So now we're kind of going into more sort of one to one work around matches, um, but they don't actually play games. So it's it's not something that your son uh, will be looking at for the sort of rest of this season okay that's fine thank you good question um any other questions some some good stuff in the chat so th thanks bertie uh, achievement chart process not outcome and asking growth questions so it seems to be the takeaways uh somebody else has got um somebody butterworth there ask open questions reinforce growth mindset the confidence peaks chart really good Growth mindset, process, not outcome, success and failure, how to learn from both. Really good point, Matt, that there, there is learning in, in both, definitely. And I, th I think that's the that's a really good way if they ever talk about failure as failure, because often kids will see it as failure. We need to help them see that it's learning. I think you're spot on with that. Um, Andrew Cutler, thanks. MCPC, handling setback, process, not outcome. Um, WB, DMB, process, not outcome and use of car time. That there's some there's been some really interesting research and a lot of practitioners as well over sort of the last four or five years have, have talked a lot about the importance of the car journey if, if you're looking to develop um, kind of athletes or talented performers so it, it, there's quite a lot of stuff out there um, on that so I'm glad that's resonated um, Andrew will I send a link to the presentation I'm actually going to email across the slides as soon as I come off the call I'll forward them through to to Tom and Pete um, so you'll get that straight away hopefully that's okay Leon thanks player diary really good one Sharo resilient process routine good stuff the really important thing for me from this is that um, you know you you've taken something away for, for your son or daughter that resonates with with them and if, if anybody's got anything that um, they'd really like to follow up on um, you know I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, um, you know take any other uh, kind of emails or, or responses or if there's anything further uh, Pete uh, Tom's just put in there thanks Tom you'll share the presentation on Thursday brilliant that's great Okay, so any other any other questions? Um, thanks for take, take, taking the time to join everybody. I've got a request in there for my um, email. I'll just pop an email address in there if you want to contact me in any way.
Okay, brilliant. Tom, um, anything uh, anything from you? Just finally from me, just to thank you, Steve, for delivering that. That was brilliant. And thanks to everyone that joined in the meeting as well. I'm sure your boys will greatly benefit from this experience. And, you know, it's definitely something we'll look to do again. So, yeah, thanks so much, Steve. That was great. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tom. All the best. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, guys, for your time. Thank you.